everybody and welcome to Revive Church. Today I think is going to be a very spiritual day with the Word of God in the room. Hello everybody. Vicky, cut my hair. Those are the times that we're living in. Let me show you how that went. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. I am keeping my hat on for the remainder of this show. Unless you pay a big donation to the building fund, I may take it off at the end. Shall we see? <laughs> Let's see how see. we do. Let's see. All right. Hey, we've got some worship coming up today. We have got some prayer. We've got a teaching for you. We hope to leave you encouraged and excited. We're going to start with worship this week. And we've got some worship with the Worship Academy guys. So what do we want people to do? We want them to... Join in and let's worship. Yeah, come on. Let's worship with the guys from Worship Academy. If you can, get up or kneel. Let's give God some praise and worship and experience his presence this morning.
Isn't it wonderful to worship and to be in God's presence? I just pray that the presence of God would have filled your home wherever you are. If you want an extended time of worship, we're going to put a worship playlist in the details with this program down in the text. And you can have an extended time of worship there and really just in, enjoy God's presence. We want to talk a little bit about prayer and the word of God. I know Revival Kids have been talking about getting the sword of the spirit out on their Facebook account and on their Instagram account, which is fantastic. And we've got a bit of a story about that, haven't we, Zach? Yes. Um, you used to get scared. What kind of stuff did you used to get scared of? Um, uh, monsters and mummification, Oh, usually. mummification, learning at school. That's not pleasant, is it? So you yeah. used to get a bit scared at bedtime. What did mum do for you? So she made me a little confession so I'd read it out every night and I wouldn't be scared. And you, you memorised it. Yeah. And so actually, we were out the other day on one of our exercise walks that we're allowed to go on and we were out in a forest and you recited the first one that you learned. Let's have a little look at that. Fear. 
I refuse to allow you to control me in the name of Jesus, for it is written, God will never give me a spirit of fear, but the Holy Spirit who gives me mighty power, love and self-control. God's Holy Spirit in me is far stronger than anything in the world. I choose to be strong and brave because God will march ahead of me. With God on my side, I am fearless. Jesus, you tell me, don't be afraid. I belong to you. You will always be there for me. I love you, God. You make me strong. God is bedrock under my feet, the castle in which I live, my rescuing knight. Amen. Isn't that fantastic? Memorizing the Word of God, replacing poor thoughts with the Word of God is how to overcome fear. Memorize it, repeat it, emphasize different parts of the portions of Scripture and get the Word of God into you in this time as you pray. Right, we're going to go to the teach this morning. What do you want to say about the teaching? So this teaching is going to mostly be about um, the atmosphere of God and... um, Look how he's going to be my dad, obviously. So, <laughs> so pre- be prepared. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then. Let's go to the TBN studios, and I'm going to talk about the atmosphere of heaven. I want to talk about the presence and the power of God being real and vibrant. The way I see church life is, if it's in the book of Acts, it should be happening today. Now, that's a deep and powerful challenge to me, not just to do church, but to be a man of God, to reach out and expect God to do things in and among us. You know, in Jerusalem, people used to gather from all around because the glory of God was resting behind a veil. But the reality is, by the time we get to Jesus' day, there was no glory behind that veil. So, you know, the veil was torn in two when Jesus died. Actually, when it opened, what it kind of revealed is there's nothing there. And sometimes our churches can be like that. We're going through all the ritual, but is God really there? I used to live uh, abroad, and, and when I was a child, my, my mum's dad died. And so she came back to England for the funeral, and she went to the mortuary, and, and they'd kind of done, done him up a bit. She went to say an emotional goodbye to her father who'd passed away. And she went in, and there he was, sat there. And she put her hand out to touch his hand because she wanted to kind of go, there, there, Dad, it'll be okay. And when she reached out and touched his hand, she realized, oh, he's not there. That's not my dad. He's gone. And I do wonder sometimes if people touch the church and go, actually, you sing lots of stuff and you say lots of stuff, but is your God really there? I want people, when they touch our churches, to know and realize, wow, God is in this place. The Apostle Paul, well, he, when he's teaching the Corinthians how to tidy up their worship, he says, still, unbelievers should come in among you. And when you're prophesying, they'll fall down on their faces and say, God is in this place. God is among you. That's what even tidy church should be like, according to the Apostle Paul. But who knows that very often church isn't like that. We can go through the songs. We can preach our preaches. We can do our social action. But let's be honest. Is the glory of God among us in the way that he should be? When I go back through history and I read things like, take, for instance, the Welsh Revival. The Welsh Revival was an incredible time in God. The front of newspapers said things like, uh, uh, something from another world is at work in Wales. Can you imagine that happening today? There was a miner who got saved in the Welsh Revival, and he was used to mining explosions. And he said the Welsh Revival felt like a mining explosion There was divine debris in the air. The air was thick with a spiritual climate from heaven. And that's what I want to talk about today, spiritual, divine climate change. I believe God wants to transform how our nation feels completely because we're supposed to, church isn't just supposed to be social action and the stuff that we do and it's all good, the singing, the worship, the preaching, all these things are great, but we're supposed to also have an atmosphere, the atmosphere of God among us, to the point where Peter would walk down a street and his shadow would heal the sick. Where is that church today? That's my longing. That's my challenge. And I think I'm challenging me as much as you today. Are we really seeing the glory and the power and the presence of God among us in the full way that we want? 
Let's think about history for a moment. Do you know that Wesley, when he preached, well, think about how Wesley transformed the country. He really did. The nation was transformed, and some historians would say that uh, what happened through the Wesleyan revival gave us our middle classes. Poorer people stopped gambling and drinking and suddenly became more affluent, and it created a middle class. He really, and people around him at the same time, transformed the nation. But we often hear the statistics. We hear about the preachers, and of course, with Wesley, there was a method. That's why they're called Methodists. But there was also so much more than that. There was atmosphere. There was an incredible atmosphere in the nation in the time of Wesley. Do you know when Wesley used to preach? Young men would climb up into the trees because he was a field preacher. They'd gather in their thousands in fields. Young men would climb up into the trees. They would say to the young men, don't get in the tree because if you climb the tree while Wesley's preaching, you won't stay in the tree because the presence of God is going to hit this field. And of course, young men being young men, they still climbed the trees and sat in the trees to try and see him and, and hear him. But as Wesley would preach, you would hear the cries of young men falling out of trees as they become overwhelmed by the very presence and power of God. So Wesley's preaching and you'd hear, ah, boom, ah, boom, and they'd be falling out of the trees. Said, Can you imagine that today? That the presence and the power of God is so strong that people can't even stand in our services. Well, listen, it's happened before and I believe it's going to happen again. The revivalist Finney, he would ride past a factory. And even just as he rode past the factory, the glory of God hit a factory. And people began to fall to their knees around the factory, giving their lives to Christ. There was a time in the northeast of England when the presence of God was so strong, it was like an atmosphere resting over cities. And sailors would be sailing past the northeast of England. And as they come within a mile of shore, sailors would begin to fall to their knees on the deck, giving their lives to Christ, because there was an atmosphere. If you go to a good old-fashioned Sally Army building, thinking of the Salvation Army and the fire and the revival that they came with in those early days. If you go to a good old Salvation Army building, you'll find shelves along the back wall. And you might think, as I thought, what are the shelves for? And they would say, well, those were the days when the fire would fall on the Salvation Army services. And the caretaker of the building, he couldn't wait till people got off the floor because they were so overwhelmed by the Spirit of God. He wanted to go home to bed. So he just put the bodies on the shelves along the back of the church, locked them in and let them out in the morning. Whoa, can you imagine God doing stuff like that again where people are so overwhelmed by the power and presence of God that they uh, just can't get up? And of course, the great thing here is not whether people are overwhelmed or not, but so many people realize God is in this place. It's not a religion, it's not a ritual, it's not a formula, it's not just a method. God himself can walk through a nation and transform it. In more modern times, we think of figures like Catherine Kuhlman. When Catherine Kuhlman was being, uh, uh, going somewhere abroad, she'd go to the airport, she'd ride a, arrive at the airport like the rest of us would, and she'd go through the airport, but she caused chaos as she walked through because people were being healed, people were being overwhelmed by the Spirit of God, people falling over under the presence of God in the airport. In the end, they said, Miss Kuhlman, please don't come to the airport. We will send a car to pick you up from your house and deliver you to the steps of the plane. Please do not come through our airport because the presence of God was so strong on this woman's life. Keith Green, a great pianist musician in the, in the 80s, I believe this was, he would, he would play and as he played, people would fall to the ground in the parks and the sports facilities nearby. Such was the climate, the atmosphere around some of these figures. I would love it if church had this atmosphere again. We find it every now and then. People go, I just felt drawn. We had one uh, recently in one of our congregations where a young man, he, he got on a bus and he didn't know why, wasn't, hadn't given his life to Christ, wasn't saved as we'd call it. And he just felt to get off a bus at a certain moment. And he felt drawn into a building where we have one of our services, just a local community hall. He said, I don't know why, but I feel drawn in here. And he was touched by the presence of God. You know, there are things that go on but I don't know about you, I long for so much more. God wants to bring a divine climate change to our churches. And he's going to bring it, I believe, until the point where once again believers walk down a street and their shadows heal the sick. So my question is, that, that's fantastic, Jared, but what, what can we do about it? How can we create divine climate change? Well, I think there's, there's two sides. One literally is God's timing. Uh, I, I wrote a book a little while ago called 500, and it talks about the seasons of 500 years, which are, if you study them, every 500 years, God seems to slightly change 
what he is doing in the world. And, and so I studied, I track right back through history and I began with uh, people like Abraham. Every 500 years, think of these major figures. You've got Abraham and his family. You've got Moses, you've got David, King David. You've got the exile and, and turmoil in Israel. Then 500 years later, you've got Jesus himself. 500 years later, the dark ages begin. 500 years after that, there's the great schism as the church splits in two. And then 500 years ago was the Reformation with Martin Luther, which of course we've enjoyed the transformation of today. So that was 500 years ago. Here's a thought. You were alive right now at one of those transformation seasons in history. It was 500 years since the Reformation. I believe God is doing something extraordinary even right now. Currently, there are more people being raised from the dead around the world than ever in history. I've got a friend, their church has a resurrection team. They've seen about nine people raised from the dead. He was recently in Siberia doing a conference and they asked him to talk about, well, how can we get people raised from the dead? Uh, so he, he teaches them some basic principles, the same principles as miracles, faith and healing. And, and then he's, he prays with them and he prays with a couple hundred people, says, go out and just pray for every dead person you find. I don't know about you. We don't see many in England, but in the country where it was, a little bit more available, I suppose. Within 24 hours, they'd seen two more people raised from the dead. More people are being raised from the dead than ever in history. We are alive at an extraordinary time. In the Welsh revival, about 100,000 people came to Christ. I've actually been in a service with Reinhard Bonnke when over a million people have come to Christ in one service. 10 Welsh revivals in one evening. That's just phenomenal. There are incredible things going on in the world right now. And that's because of timing. And that's one of the great things is sometimes God is doing things in the seasons that he chooses. The great news for us is God is alive and working right now and doing extraordinary things around the world right now. There are more people born again right now than have ever been born again in all of history combined. There is an incredible move of God going on because of timing. That's not up to us, that's up to God, but we just happen to be alive for such a time as this. But here's the second powerful thing. We can do something that affects the climate. And here's a little scripture to give us a little clue. It's Hosea and it's chapter six. And it's verse three. I love this scripture. Listen to it. It says this, let us acknowledge the Lord. Let us press on to acknowledge him. As surely as the sun rises, he will appear. He will come to us like the winter rains, like spring rains that water the earth. I love that. Let us acknowledge the Lord. That means let us experience him. Let us press on, it says, to experience him. In other words, I'm going after God and I'm pressing on to experience God. Think about prayer, think about worship, think about fasting, think about longing for him. I'm pressing on to experience God. And here is what the Bible says happens when we press in to experience God. It says, as surely as the sun rises, God appears. He comes to us like winter rain. This is why I call this program Divine climate change. If we press on to experience God, he will come to us like the rain. I remember August 2011, I was picking up some of our youth from a conference. And when I went to pick them up, uh, I, I guess there was, was hundreds of youth in this event, but half a dozen of our youth were outside the meeting, lying on some grass. And they were overwhelmed by the power and presence of God. I don't mean they were saying that I had a nice few goosebumps. There was a sense of God, a gentle sense. They were completely overwhelmed by the presence of God. And I said to them, what's happened to you? What, what, what was going on in that meeting? They said, oh, no, it wasn't the meeting. We got thrown out of the meeting. The presence of God had hit half a dozen of our youth, and they were completely overwhelmed by the power of God to the level that they could not get up. Well, I scraped one of them up, put them in my car. I'm driving, because I had to take him home to his mum and dad. And I'm driving and I'm like, what happened? He said, I don't know. Just the presence of God hit us and these young kids were just overwhelmed by the power of God. Now, we were in a, a, a little season of prayer and fasting. You could say we were pressing on to experience God as a church. I'll be honest, we'd done it many times. I did not know that this time something absolutely extraordinary was going to happen. We were uh, three weeks into prayer and fasting as a church, and suddenly, well, we had a little conference. I'd called it, God will come like the rain. Isn't it funny? Sometimes God does read the advertising and does what it says. Well, God came like 
the rain. There was an incredible move of God. Leaders, leaders who have been leaders and Christians 30, 40, 50 years were saying, I feel like I've been born again, again. It's almost like everything we've done up to now has been in a drought and suddenly it's raining and there's fruit and there's ease. One lady, she turned up and, and she turned up in a wheelchair. She'd arrived at, at a, a local hotel and the disability facilities had failed. So the staff were having to help her upstairs with her wheelchair and stuff like that. And they were saying to her, we're so sorry about this. Why have you come? She said, oh, I've come to be healed. You watch this weekend. I'm going to be healed. Well, Four hours later, you would have found this woman pushing her own wheelchair through the reception of the same hotel, the wide-eyed receptionist looking on. The Muslim receptionist gave her life to Christ as she told the story of how she'd got out of a wheelchair just hours after arriving at the hotel. Um, God just began to heal people. You see, stuff happens when the climate changes. Sometimes we pray prayers and we think, well, maybe I don't pray right. Maybe there's some complex thing I need to be doing, some complex theology I need to understand. Listen, sometimes it's the climate that needs to change. Something needs to happen in the whole atmosphere that means we pray the same prayers, but so much more happens. I hear leaders that say, if you keep doing the same thing, you'll always get the same results. I get that to some degree with regards to culture. That is true. But with regards to supernatural ways of God, you can do one thing, and I know God is everywhere all the time, but he doesn't manifest his presence in localized places all the time. When God actually turns up in all of his presence, you can pray the simplest prayers. Honestly, I've been in meetings when it's like the presence of God is so thick, you're drinking it in, breathing it in and out. The atmosphere is thick with God, and you only have to point at people and they get healed. Stuff that you've prayed and longed and repented and all the, all the things you need, to, you need to do and you try to do to get healed. But then when God is there, suddenly the power of God does stuff and you go, my, my, my. Life can be like the book of Acts. There was a lady in our church, she'd broken the bottom of her back and she was in agony for six and a half years. Now she's a dear friend, she's a leader. Her husband is very, um, how shall I put it, very successful in the pharmaceutical industry. And so she had the best medical care that she could possibly have and she was still in agony. Six and a half years, we prayed. And like you do when you're a pastor, you pray every way you can think to try and get the thing moving. You anoint them with oil, you get them to repent of stuff. You try all the techniques, you give them all the books, give them all the things to listen to, podcasts and teachings. Nothing was shifting this thing. Six and a half years of agony. Well, just a couple of weeks into the fact that God had come like the rain to our church. She was in a little prayer meeting for healing. There was, I don't know, 60, 70, 80 people there. And we just went up, up to her and we prayed in, in the way we'd prayed over and over uh, before. And we just prayed a little prayer, Jesus, heal our sister. Well, she fell to the ground, overwhelmed by the presence of God. Now, she fell on her back, which made me a bit worried. I looked at her and I looked at her husband. He looked a bit angry at me. I was thinking, oh no, I hope she's all right. And so we both stand over this lady, Sandra, and we say, Sandra, are you okay? And she opens her eyes and we're thinking, what's she going to say? My back really hurts, I don't know. She says, I can't feel a thing. And I think, well, that's either really good or really not good. What, what do you mean you can't feel a thing? And she wiggles around a little bit and she says, there's no pain whatsoever. Then she pulls herself off the floor, which she wouldn't have been able to do before. And she wiggles around a little bit. She can't find any pain. She grabs her husband. She says, let's get in the car. I want to go drive. They get into their car and they're driving home from church. Normally, he'd be driving really slow. He'd be missing every speed bump, every pothole because she'd be in agony if he hit all the potholes. And driving home, she's going, go on, hit that pothole. Come on, drive faster. Hit that speed bump over there. And she's wiggling around in her seat. No pain whatsoever. Same little prayer we'd prayed a thousand times before. And here she was completely healed. It's like this scripture, the power of the Lord was present to heal the sick. We need God to be present in our churches again. He actually comes. We know he can do anything, anytime, anywhere, but we want him to be among us and to come like the rain and transform the atmosphere. There were incredible healings that took place in that time. I remember being in the city centre of Hull and seeing our youth leader and a, a whole group of maybe 20, 30 of our young people all dressed in high-vis jackets, surrounded by maybe five, six, seven hundred people. I'd said to them, why don't you get a little bit of music, maybe some backing tracks, 
sing a song, pray for some people, see what happens. Try an open air. It's years since we'd done one. Well, they got up, they sang a song. Five, six, seven hundred people gathered in the center of Hull. And well, I didn't realize he was going to do this, but this young youth leader, he just started to bring words of knowledge. And he began to share There's people out there that got this problem and that problem and the other problem. As we sing the next song, come forward and we'll pray for you. And our young people, normal, 14, 15, 16 year olds, start praying for people on the streets of Hull. People are giving up crutches. They're pulling out hearing aids from people's ears. Incre people are giving up Zimmer frames in the middle of the city center of Hull. And I'm there at the back of the crowd going, good heavens, this is like the days of revival. I got to be honest, in several months, I counted 60 deaf ears open, people giving up hearing aids and stuff like that. I stopped counting after 60 because I knew I was getting inaccurate. The youth leader was said to me, I've stopped counting the people saved on the streets at 150 because I realized I'm now getting inaccurate. When it starts to rain, our Christianity is activated and God begins to move. How do we make it rain? We press in to experience him. Now, several things are going to happen when we begin to push in to the power and presence of God. The first thing is authority begins to break out among us. In other words, stuff starts to happen. The most frustrating thing about Christianity can be often that stuff just isn't happening. When it starts to rain, it starts to happen. We had a school at our church at the time, and my, my young son, he was five, six years old, he was at the school. And one of the five-year-old girls, she broke her ankle, she went to hospital, she had an x-ray, she had a temporary cast put on her leg, and she came to school. In school, a little group of five, six-year-olds gathered around this young girl and prayed for her that she would be healed in Jesus' name. And they prayed like a five or six-year-old would pray. And then a few days later, she went back to the hospital for a second x-ray and a slightly more permanent cast to be put on her leg. Well, when they did the second x-ray, the break had completely gone by the prayers of a few five and six-year-olds. The afternoon she got back to school after that x-ray that showed there was no break left, she took part in the sports day. She had been completely healed. When it starts to rain, incredible authority comes to the church. Wouldn't you love it if when you prayed, stuff happened? I know we've got to pray within the will of God, but to be honest with you, when you know the name of God, you know the will of God. He is healer. He is redeemer. He is restorer. He is righteousness. He is our forgiveness. When we begin to, begin to pray in line with the will of God, stuff begins to break out and happen. Immense authority comes when it starts to reign over our cities and our churches once again. The second thing I want to say is that Healings and miracles are not a phenomenon. We're not after phenomenon. We're not after the spectacular necessarily. Miracles are love. There was a young man called Michael. He turned up to a meeting and he sat through the meeting and uh, in a wheelchair. He'd had a stroke. He was profoundly deaf in, in both ears. He had very bad mobility, had a disability card, didn't have a job, that kind of stuff. And he sat at the back of this meeting and he was actually getting a little bit annoyed that nobody had prayed for him by the end of the meeting. At the end of the service, he went up to our operations manager and he says, no one's prayed for me. So our operations manager normally deals with technical things and business things and all this kind of stuff. He turns around and says, well, I'm here, I'll pray for you. So he begins to pray for this young man, Michael. And as he prays, he gets out of his wheelchair and to be honest with you, at first he fell over. And I, we were thinking, well, that's not very good. But then he gets up. He takes out his hearing aids and we discover he can walk and his hearing has come back. Now listen, here's the point of this story. When he got back home that night, he had married as a disabled man, had never, in British tradition as we do, never been able to carry his new wife over the threshold into their house. So that night, it was a Thursday night, he had got completely healed. He arrives back at home, picks up his wife and carries her over the threshold. When you talk to that man today and you say, so what does your healing mean? He says, it's like I became a man again. I have my dignity back again. I can play football with my sons. I can cook for my wife. He gave up his disability car. He started a market gardening business. Isn't that incredible? Completely healed. And what had it done? It had shown the love of God to that whole family. Healings and miracles, they're not phenomenon. They're God showing his love and his redemptive power to people's lives. That's what healings and miracles do. They reveal the love of God. Of course, it's loving to comfort the sick. 
but even more loving to heal the sick. And think about Jesus' ministry. That's exactly what he did. He healed the sick again and again and again. Something happens when God begins to come like the rain. Let me end with a story about the revivalist Edward Miller. He went to a place where revival had been in the past. And this was a man of the presence. He loved the presence and the power of God. He had seen God bring revival to Argentina. And he turned up to this nation that had had revival in the past, but weren't in it right now. And it was a conference. There was hundreds of Christians gathered. And he got up to do his piece. And he's, he's sharing and, and, and talking. And, and, and he pauses. And he just looks above the crowd. And he's just silent, almost like he is now more conscious of the spirit than of the physical in that room. And he looked about the crowd and he was perfectly silent for a while. And then he said, are you still there? And as he said those words, it's like the Holy Spirit fell out of the sky on the people there. All he said was, are you still there? I wonder over our nation, over your city, over your church, wherever you are, Maybe God is waiting in another realm for someone to say, God, are you still there? The God of Elijah, are you still there? The God of the early disciples in the book of Acts, are you still there? The God who enabled people to be healed just at the shadow of a saint, are you still there? I believe he is still there. God is waiting for us to press in to experience him. And his promise is this. I will come like the rain. I pray that you would press on to experience God and you would know him coming like the rain over your home, your street, your church, your city, and even your entire land. May God bless you as you seek him to come like the rain. Well, I hope you found that inspiring. We need to pray for the atmosphere of heaven to be moving over our land at this time. We need God, everybody knows it. There may be people in fact on this program and you you wouldn't call yourself a Christian. You, you don't have a walk with God at this point, um, but you can start that right now. Here's the gospel in a nutshell. The world is a broken, sinful, messed up place and it's mankind that's messed it up. But Jesus died on the cross as our savior to take the punishment for all man's sinfulness, badness, and sadness. And if we repent, completely turn our lives around and say, okay, God, I need a completely new path. I need you. Then God will come into our lives. We can begin a relationship with him because he died on the cross so that we could be holy once again because of what he's done for us. Turn to God. There's some information, some websites in the details with this program where you can go and have a look at how to become a Christian, how to pray, how to get to know God, and then how to find a church, which we'd love you to do. Come and see us sometime. We would love that. A few little bits of practical information. We're going to be hooking you up with how to join the NHS team, the council teams near where you live. If you are uh, healthy and strong and you can get out and help people. In fact, you can just make phone calls too. If you can join one of the teams around our region helping people, that would be fantastic. Again, we say it every week, Revive, we want to help you and support you and your loved ones. If our team can deliver groceries or make a phone call to you or your loved ones let us know if you're on your own at the moment or isolated or ill or any loved ones that you can't support we're here to help you do that is that okay uh, next week it's not just going to be Jared and Zach and a few others again we want to bring some more voices in because it is Easter next weekend so it's going to be really really different we're going to have two shows we're going to have one at 11 o'clock uh, good Friday morning and um, one on Easter Sunday morning 11 o'clock as well and it's going to be a little bit different to these times together we're going to have communion in both of those and uh, so just pray as we pull all of this together because it takes a lot even to create something quite simple so please be praying for the teams but more than the internet stuff the really real stuff of looking after the people in your friendship circle and in your family circle please do that extra phone calls, extra texting, extra FaceTime, extra Zoom if you've got the technology to do it. We really want you to stay in touch with each other, okay? So let's be doing that. Um, right, 
we're getting near the end of today's time together. Uh, I found this on YouTube and it is wonderful. It is our Angie Lendon. Angie, uh, oh, Anna and Angie's daughter is about to have a baby. In fact, by the time this goes out, she might have had it. Anna, we are praying for you at this time that God is with you and his strength is with you. Um, now, Angie, got this wonderful song called Thy Kingdom Come. I was listening to it on YouTube the other day. It's a few years old now, but I thought this is such a song for this moment. So we we'll blast this one out and use it to pray. Pray for the Prime Minister and all of his team. Pray for the NHS workers. Pray for the supermarket workers. Pray for those on their own stuck in. Pray for those who are ill. Would you, while we blast this song out, would you pray for people in your friendship circle and beyond that you know about? Pray for people in the nations that you know about. It's actually a lot harder in third world uh, nations right at this time to go through these lockdown seasons. So let's be praying for everything that you can think of while we enjoy this song together, Thy Kingdom Come. This is a song for the city of Hull. You are 
Wasn't that a wonderful song? I hope you had a good time praying to that. I love it. Well done, Angie. Thank you for that. What's that I see down in the comments? Stuart McKinley has given a million pounds to see me remove my hat. Okay, oh he hasn't. It's all pre-recorded. He hasn't. But anyway, are you ready? Are you steady? <laughs> He actually he, did a great job. He, he basically looks bald. <laughs> <laughs> I do that anyway. That's not Mickey's fault. Guys, 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 in the shininess. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there right. you go. Hey, she could open her own salon. She did a great job. Duh. Fantastic. She, All right. If you want to know the college, go to the College of YouTube. Oh, yes. We watch YouTube videos before doing it. Well, there you go. Such times we are in. It's been great to be with you today. How do we always finish these programs? Jesus yes, bless, bless you. you. Keep you healthy, healthy safe, safe and, and strong. strong. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Bye.